we were talking like row crop compared to a horticulture grow. Um, those are very big differences as well, right? Well, um, there's you need males to make seeds. So if you're if you're um, if you're growing for seed, you gotta have some males in there. Otherwise, you're not gonna have any seeds, right? So, but no, yeah, hemp comes as, as male and female, as does marijuana. It, you know, it depends. If you're growing for flower, you just are gonna have females. So, um, yeah, I hear a lot of just random misconceptions everywhere. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Mandy with Global Hemp Association. I wanted to say thank you so much for joining. I'm excited about the opportunity to build a relationship and connect this supply chain. I mean, after all, that's why we started the association. Our association was built on the foundation of connecting supply chain, building relationships, and helping you grow your business. Anyone from farmers, manufacturers, and distributors, people that are passionate about the supply chain, and those creating products selling into biofuels, plastics, textiles, construction, and building materials. So I'm really excited. What are some of the top, and I guess before we get started, I better back up and first introduce who you are and how you got into this industry and welcome, you know, why should people be listening and why are people listening to you? Why do people chime in and the amount of knowledge that you have? So I'm curious, how'd you get here? How'd you, how'd you acquire this? How'd you end up in this space? Tell me all the goods. Uh, <laughs> so I... Uh, I did my master's in plant population genetics, and I was looking at um, hybridization levels between two closely related r- closely related cacti. One of them is rare, one of them isn't, and basically land managers wanted to know, like, are they hybridizing? Because if they are, then there's no point in protecting them. But if they're not, then, you know, they need to make land decisions, right? So, so that's my background, plant population genetics, and then after, I promise I'm going somewhere with the story. Um, Then after I did my master's, I uh, worked at the Denver Botanic Gardens, and I ran their conservation and genetics lab for like two years. And I had a volunteer that worked with me there who was in getting into the cannabis industry right after they legalized in Colorado. So that was in 2012, and his company was, at the time, they were making edibles, but they have since branched out, and now they're the company that makes open vape. Um, But we would have you know, discussions about cannabis and um, genetics and just all kinds of interesting conversations. Um, And I had heard that if you go to different dispensaries and buy the same thing, they're not going to be the same. Like very often, you know, if you find something that you like and it's called, I use the, I use Blue Dream as the example because everybody's heard of it. Um, But like if you buy Blue Dream at one store and then go to a different store, chances are they're, they're going to be different. And I thought that was really strange that first they would have the same name but not have the same effects, um, especially since I knew or I had I, – I kind of um, was under the assumption that everyone was cloning, right? Um, or even if they were growing from seeds, like you're supposed to start with the same stuff. So why are, why are they turning out so different? So then I got this idea because of my background in population genetics. I was like, this is a really easy question to answer. Like – you know, I have the tools and I have the know-how to figure this out. Um, so I approached the, my PI, my mentor, who I did my master's work with, and I asked him, and, you know, I told him about this, and I was like, we should do this. And he's like, no, we're not doing cannabis. <laughs> he's like, that is just, no, like, no. He's like, I don't want to be that guy. Uh, but then his wife convinced him, he's like, she's like, somebody has to be that guy. Why don't you be that guy? So he called me back into his office and was like, all right, well, I'm still not going to be that guy, but I will be your mentor. It, all of this is on you. He's like, I don't know anything about cannabis. I don't know where to get money for this research project, so you're going to have to figure all that out. He's like, but it's a good idea. It's a very easy question to answer, and we're going to have to come up with some more stuff, um, some more questions to answer. Uh, so basically, I designed my own PhD, and... Um, there was even some research that I did that didn't make it into my dissertation because I had to finish at some point. <laughs> and and oh, every, yeah. every time I finish something, I have a new question that I want to answer. And, you know, I can't, you can't stay in school for, well, you could, but, um, no, I needed to graduate. So, so that was my first question that I answered. And then, um, it kind of, it kind of went from there and I ended up with, uh, Let's see. So the first chapter was differences, genetic differences within strains that are acquired from different 
sources. So I went around to different dispensaries, bought the same thing, and then did some genetic tests to figure out, are they the same or are they completely different? Then the next one was actually supposed to be like a mentor project where I had an undergraduate who wanted to get some cannabis uh, experience. And so I designed this little project for him and we were looking at the genetic spectrum of cannabis. So I had some cultivated hemp, some wild feral hemp. I had some CBD type uh, strains. Then, you know, I had a whole bunch of like sativa hybrid indicas. And I also happened to have some DNA from uh, plants that came from the University of Mississippi who they provide all of the research grade marijuana for, for marijuana studies. So I also happened to have some of that. So we threw that in there and it turned out to be a really interesting result that we got. And so we've written up that paper and it is been in review for like two years now. Like I don't know if they're like scared to publish it or what's going on, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really tough to get that one published. And um what we found was that the University of Mississippi, the, the cannabis that they're supplying for, for medical studies is more genetically related to hemp than it is to what anybody has access to on the legal market, which was super interesting um, huh. because that shouldn't be the case. Um, interesting. And then, and then the next study that we did, we knew that there were differences within strains, so I went and picked up, I think we had, we had four strains multiple different samples in each category. One that we knew was a, a genetic outlier, and then we had a, we did a smell study to see if people could smell the difference. And uh, analyzing that data was really challenging. There were 50, I wanna say there were 55 participants, and they had like an iPad, and they, they did a check all that apply. Um, it was double blind, so neither the researcher nor the participant knew what they were smelling. So they would just log in the number of what they were smelling, and then they would check all the boxes for all the smells that they smelled. So basically, mm -hmm. 55 people, 40 smells possible. Like, you can imagine maybe what that data set looks like. Um, but that turned out right. to be super interesting, too, because there was a lot of differences, even when they were genetically identical, like the variation in, in the smells was really different, but they, there was definitely obvious differences in the one that was a genetic outlier compared to the ones that were genetically identical. And then we also had three samples of Durban poison that were all identical um, without a genetic, genetic outlier, just to look and see like how much variation is you know within, um, and there's a lot. And so then after that, I actually wanted to look at the cannabinoids and the terpenes to see what is the difference. Like, and it's just all over the place. Like they're just different. Um, even when they're genetically identical, which says that the environment is playing a large part in the expression of these plants. So when you grow two things in two different places, the different water regimes, different nutrients, different soil, different growing techniques, different harvest times, different curing process, like, you're going to get a lot of variation, um, more than I expected, <laughs> and probably more than anyone would realize. Um, so that was interesting, and then, yeah, and then I had an epigenetic experiment that I'm still doing. I haven't finished it yet, but <laughs> so even though you're really out of school, you're really still learning. I mean, especially in this yeah. industry, it is just like you said, one question after the next, right? <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about the consumer, right? This is something that's hard to explain to a consumer. And why why is it different? Can you break it down in layman's terms to them? And what should we as consumers be looking for or aware of if we're walking into a store and wanting to buy Blue Dream in Utah compared to Denver or somewhere else? So the, the, the easiest way I can explain it to somebody is that Phenotype, so your end product is a combination, it results from a combination of genetics, like what it, what, what tools, what, what are you made up of, like what kind of gene, genetic expression can you have? So genotype plus environment. So um, if you've got different environments, you're gonna end up with different phenotypes. If you've got different genetics, you're gonna end up with different phenotypes. Those two things in combination with each other work together. Um, so we do expect to see some level of variation. Um, and I like to reference apples, for example. Like if you go into a grocery store, all the apples are not identical, 
but there is a level of consistency that you would expect. So a Granny Smith, you know what they look like, you know what they taste like. They're not all exactly the same, but there is a, a level of expectation there for a Granny. If it's red, you're going to question: Is that real? That's not a. That's not a Granny Smith. Right. Not right. That's right. Um. So there, you know, if 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 two growers are growing the same thing and putting it on the shelf under the same name, you would also have some level of expectation that they're very similar. But when you start with something that's genetically different, there's very little chance that you're going to end up with something, you know, the same. So and right now there, there's no, there's no way for anyone to check. There's no database. There's no certifications that come along to say, yes, this is what no. this is. Um, and as far as a consumer goes, you know, they don't know what ha what's growing behind the doors. They don't, they just have to trust that what they're purchasing is what they're expecting that they're purchasing. Um, but it's not always the case. And I don't think that anyone's doing this, you know, with any, yeah, intentionally, but there are places along the whole supply chain from seed to sale where things can go wrong. Um, well, even just down to banking. Right, the cart was way before the horse, even just into the basic financing and bank. So banking, insurance, you now those it, it, marketing, right? Marketing tools yeah. and resources. Yeah, so I, tell, I think I, the I consumer people, forgets. I tell people if you find something that you like, well, go back and get more of it because it might not be there, <laughs> yeah. you know, or it might not be the same next time. So <laughs> if you really, really like, um, you know, get it while it lasts, <laughs> and. Yeah. And, and, um, hopefully you'll be able to find it again, but I think education is a big part of this. Just letting people know, um, that their expectations might not always be met, but this is why. And, you know, the grape industry and the olive industry also started like this. Grapes and olives have been around forever. There's tons of different varieties. Um, and before we had genetic tools to actually verify things, there were olives that the, the same types of olives, but two different names. There were different olives with the same name. And so that's kind of where I feel like we are in the cannabis industry on both sides of that 0.3% hemp and um, everybody hates this word, but marijuana, or whatever. Um, <laughs> but everywhere in the industry, I feel like that's where we are because it has been underground for so long um the record keeping hasn't been the best so it's kind of a little bit of a mess right now but i feel like we'll get there um i used to always laugh when people said hey well this is bubba kush and i was like how do you know how do you know yeah yeah <laughs> like just, well this is what's selling today so this is what we're going to write on our package as we ship it across the country in our brown paper bags or whatever and i right. really hope people aren't doing that but there's a good chance that there are people doing that so. or if they aren't now they were right because like you said how do you know how do you know it, it it's like the game of telephone is it transitions hands hands and oh the label fell off or oh this was supposed to go here and, and again it may not be intentionally but it is definitely that mm -hmm. you know, and yes. i think without the science and without the the data and the tracking it's been hard to like you say no well i had a sample that was called labeled Island Sweet Skank, and I was like, I'm pretty sure it's Island Sweet Skunk, but whatever. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that was somebody's bad handwriting, and it just got transferred as Island Sweet Skank. Um, I also had two samples, both purchased from the same dispensary. One was called Larry OG, and one was called Tahoe OG, I, genetically identical. So someone mixed up something somewhere, and yeah, that's like that game of telephone. I mean, really, it's like, like you said, bad handwriting. It's mm -hmm. anything. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, with underground trading, you know, clones and cuts and things like that, um, you know, like you could go over to your friend's house and they tell you what it is. By the time you get home and start growing it, you're like, oh, shit, what was it called? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. I'll just make it up. You know, now you've got two things that are genetically identical with two different names because you didn't remember, you know, and so this stuff happens, but mm -hmm. I feel like um, because the industry is growing so big and so fast and there is a lot of money, there's a lot of, you know, and I always think about the medical patients, you know, it, it for a recreational person, maybe not, or, or just an adult use, like 
it maybe not be so important, you know, it might just be a difference in how you spend your day. But right. for a medical patient, if they're not getting what they think they are getting because they need it, like that's a different outcome completely if they're, you know, being supplied with the wrong thing. So, um, but I do think we'll get there eventually. Um, and you know, growers want to know what they have. They want to know have some I had somebody one time say it's been a big transition going from burning our receipts to now documenting everything. And I think as we transition and more of it becomes readily available or accessible to say, I, I guess it's like the track and trace, right? It's, it's one of the biggest pieces that's constantly being talked about within the industry and over into the hemp industry or the hemp space on the industrial side, right? From the, just like cotton on the, from seed to soil or soil yeah. to to garment, to cradle, <laughs> to whatever, wherever it goes afterwards, right? There's all yeah, and, and in the cotton industry, they, um, I, I've heard about this. I can't verify it, but they have these DNA trackers. Mm -hmm. Like they tag it with a piece of mm -hmm. DNA so that even when it's a t-shirt, you can potentially, you know, do a PCR mm -hmm. test on it. And, oh yeah, this is from this place. It's got the, the bio tag. So, mm -hmm. We can do that too. Um, well, and I think we have an opportunity to fix it before it's broken, right? To implement new processes that then we can avoid some of the pitfalls in the cotton industry or in some of these others that, you know, we have an opportunity to make change basically. So talk to me, you said earlier, education. You know, education really is key. Talk to me about what you're doing to, for education and what are some of the hot topics you guys are focusing on? So I teach modern cannabis science. I co-teach it with Daniela Vergara, who is also a very well established and um, <laughs> yeah, and very well, uh, you know, she's um, a wonderful human being and very knowledgeable about the cannabis industry. Um, we co we we created this course together. Uh, we had a third person who was part of that team that created this course, um, but she's gone. She got a she got a proper job and like. <laughs> <laughs> She's not teaching, <laughs> but we're go we're going into this fall semester. Will be our fifth semester that we're teaching it, and it is a really science heavy cannabis course. Um, we don't teach you how to grow. We don't teach you how to smoke. We and and we we kind of we do cover pharma uh, pharmacology a little bit and and medicine a little bit, but really it's about the plant. It's about the science of the plant. So we start with um, history and taxonomy. We talk about genotype, phenotype. We talk about, um, what else do we talk about? We talk about breeding. We talk about policy. We talk about um, medical, uh, different methods of consumption and how that works, um, you know, from an absorption and how your body processes it kind of um, uh, angle on that. And yeah, it's generally about five to seven weeks, super hard, but people love it. Um, I think there's a, we always have a couple of students who come in and it's not what they thought, you know, you see the word cannabis and you're like, oh, hell yeah, I know a lot about weed and I'm going to ace this class. It's actually I saved a these seeds yeah. and I want to learn how to grow them. <laughs> I pulled these out of the bud that I bought. <laughs> so we, yeah, so it, it's a bit different than some people think, but I mean, the students that come in, we get students from all over the world. Uh, we get people from in, from the industry who want to learn more. We get, um, you know, students who, once they graduate, would like to get into the industry. So it gives everybody who takes it, like, a lot of information. Um, and we just love teaching the class, and, and it's very well received. So, um, and then what else do I do? Um, curious about cannabis. Curious about cannabis. We have, so Jason Wilson has been doing curious about cannabis he does interview podcasts and he's also written a book and now he is teaching online workshops and has put together an incredible team of people myself is i'm one of them um linda clumpers cody uh peterson kyle boyer and just a whole bunch of people that are very knowledgeable in the cannabis space um and uh yeah so we're going to be teaching classes through the Curious About Cannabis platform. So that's exciting. And then uh, the, the clubhouse, we have a clubhouse um, on Monday nights and then and Tuesday nights. And then, yeah, just generally everybody I talk to, I try to 
education. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm curious about this transition of education, do you think, right? And what kind of knowledge has, I mean, we really went from probably a space of the basic, you know, what is the indica versus sativa or what is, you know, cannabis versus hemp? What are some of the topics that you're seeing on the consumer side or the community side compared to within the industry, right? Because I battle this a lot when I start talking or we start sharing information. I think it's two very different conversations still, at least where I'm at. Um, you know, within the industry, it's now in the industry and becoming more knowledgeable. And I still think that we hit the roadblock of, I mean, I said the word cannabis the other day when I was speaking about an industrial hemp um, project for manufacturing for uh, OSB, and it shut the whole conversation down because I said cannabis. So, yeah, so there's, uh, I don't know how, this is just such a complex yeah. issue. And this is actually one of the you know topics that we talk about in modern cannabis science is the difference between how consumers talk about things and how scientists talk about things and the gigantic gap between the two. Mm -hmm. So science hasn't found the answer to the indica sativa split. So, and with the indica sativa thing, we've got two separate things that we're talking about. On one hand, we're talking about morphology. So you look at the plant and that looks like an indica and that looks like a sativa. And those are related to how the plants look. So indicas are shorter, the leaves are fatter, it's darker in color. Sativas are taller, thinner, spindlier, thinner leaflets. They're two different morphotypes. However, consumers never get to see the plant growing and couldn't tell you what that plant looked like. And the way they talk about um, sativa and indica is related to effects. And you cannot look at a plant and say, that's going to make me tired. tired. That's going to make me tired. And this is going to, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna clean my house on this. So it's, I, and I always try to tell people, like, they're fine terms to use. You just have to be very specific about what you're talking about. Are you, when you say, is this an indica or a sativa? Do you want to know what the plant growth pattern was or like where it came from? Or do you want to know what it's going to happen to you once you consume it? Because those are two separate things that have nothing to do with each other. But unfortunately, we have the same terminology for those things. Um, but I think a lot can be cleared up if you just be specific about what you want to know or what you're talking about. So this is an indica type uh, based on its chemotype. So this will do, you know, this, will, this is an indica um, or, you know, I'm growing this indica plant. Then, you know, you're talking about the morphology. So I think a lot of misconceptions can be cleared up if people are just a little more specific because we have the same word that is talking about to like the, your, your conversation where you said cannabis. I mean, yes, they're all cannabis, everything. It's, it's one species, cannabis sativa. This is an ongoing debate. Um, but generally speaking, um, uh, the, the way that we define species, there, there's not enough difference, consistent difference between any of the types to call them new species. So there's one species, cannabis sativa. Um, but, you know, this word marijuana has got people all up in arms. Um, so well, and that's a difference. That's a difference in the industry, too, with education, right. understanding where the word came from. And yeah, yeah, but so people have started saying cannabis, but hemp is also cannabis. So now you're <laughs> another set of confusion, because when you say cannabis, you couldn't be talking about hemp and you're totally right. But because the marijuana industry is insisting that it be called cannabis, which is fine. Now, now, what do you, what do you call hemp? But it's like saying a, a boxer dog is a canine, but a lab is not a canine. Right. But um, they're both canines. They're just, yeah. Um, all hemp is cannabis, but not all cannabis is hemp. Um, and vice versa with the, with the marijuana. But what I find is that there's a very good definition for what hemp is, and it's that 0.3% THC, and no more, no less. It doesn't have to be, you know, designated for fiber or oil or seed. It can be used for flour, as we all know, with the CBD, CBG market going on. As long as it's below that line, it's considered hemp. We don't have an encompassing term for everything above the 0.3% THC line except we could call it drug type but then now we're calling it a drug which I don't like that term um, because it's medicine and drug has a negative connotation just like the word marijuana does 
But other than that, like we just don't, like you could say non-hemp, but that's a mouthful, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, there's just no real good term for any, ever, all the cannabis that is not hemp. And, well, and it's, it's, it's really relearning, relearning what we've been taught and referencing. And yeah. like I said, you say the word cannabis and it shuts people down because now you're speaking about something different. And well, and you can't even say high THC type because now you're, you're missing a whole chunk that are like THC, CBD balance types and CBG. And like, so you can't, you can't say high THC types either because there's a whole chunk there that is now not accounted for so yeah we got to sort out this terminology thing um but it's education and letting people know hey this is how it works um and when we're talking about this this is what we mean when we're talking about this this is what we mean um and just general education um and especially because there are so many misconceptions you know i've heard people say hemp hemp plants are male and marijuana plants are female and i'm like oh oh no no <laughs> oh, no <laughs> but but yeah. I have heard, right, that the certain males are better for textile fiber because the females have different nodes. And so I think that that's who we're talking like row crop compared to a horticulture grow. Mm -hmm. um, those are very big differences as well, right? Well, um, there's you need males to make seeds. So if you're if you're um, if you're growing for seed, you got to have some males in there. Otherwise, you're not going to have any seeds, right? So, but no, yeah, hemp comes as as male and female, as does marijuana. But, you know. It depends if you're growing for flower, you just are going to have females. So, um, yeah, I hear a lot of just random misconceptions everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. what do you think the message is? Like, where do we come together? We obviously host a number of these. And I have to give a really quick shout out to everybody that's listening. I'll go through and say hello here in just a minute. I see a bunch of comments that have come in. But we have an education series that we run on Thursday afternoons, and tomorrow we're talking with Billy Styles and Joe Hickey in the morning at 10 a.m. And so two farming events. And then on Thursday, you mentioned early, co earlier that Cody was going to be on, or as Cody is part of your uh, cannabis group, the Curious About Cannabis. Um, he's also going to be on uh, in the morning, I think 9 a.m. on Friday morning. So I'm really excited to continue this conversation. So shout out to them. Thank you very much for their support. Um, and thank you, Marion. I see you're listening, Thomas, Alexander. Um, Alexander said something really interesting. Hemp is already an umbrella term for fiber, grain, and extract varieties, right? Um, sure, it is. Now, where do where do you see the uh, impact of legalization impacting the potential hemp industry, or or what? I guess impact do you see that we we will be facing or maybe aren't dealing with now that's going to come as we legalize. I mean, I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, I, you know, there's people who are in on the hemp side who don't agree with the way that the industry is going because uh, it was supposed to be an industrial crop. It was never meant to be grown for medicine, but because the legal definition is that 0.3% THC, if it's under that, it's hemp. And it doesn't matter if they're growing it for flower or any other use for the plant. Um, so, uh, and the, and the, you know, the USDA regulates everything that is hemp once it goes over that 0.3%. Now we've got the DEA stepping in with regulation and then extracts our FDA. And the FDA just kind of dropped a bomb the other day that um they're going to be treating cbd as a drug so it is a drug ingredient so cbd will now be regulated as a drug i don't i think that's gonna um what about all so all the cannabinoids are no just cbd because cbd is a is an approved drug from gw pharmaceuticals yeah it's a drug ingredient so but that's now, what happens you know that that's as soon as it's considered a drug there's no it can't be nutraceutical at the same time from my understanding I think, that right i think if it was uh, an approved um, ingredient or supplement before the, before the drug got approved, then you're okay. But because CBD was mm -hmm. approved first, and the hemp and no one in the hemp industry has given the FDA enough information for them to say yes, we're going to treat it as an ingredient or a supplement. Um, yeah, they just kind of put their foot down the other day and said, yeah, we're going to be treating this as a drug, which 
sucks. Um, I know mm. that Charlotte's Web scrubbed their website and all of their packaging of the term CBD uh, a couple months ago, just very recently. Um, and it, they and everything is they 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 mention CBG, THC, other cannabinoids, terpenes, but they say hemp extract and CBD is nowhere to be found on any of their products. And they were one of the ones that put in um, a put in a document to the FDA to sh to show it's safe. And then the and then the FDA said no. So that was interesting. So this this is a huge impact for those in the CBD, especially these white label products and these for everything. I mean yeah. everything. So I don't know what's going to come of that. I mean it's uh, disturbing. I and I'm sure. There are a lot of people out there that are like, well, what do we do now? And I don't, I don't have the answer to that. But um, And how many people now have found product? You know, we just spent 30 minutes talking about product and how to find product we like and trying different product. And, and when you find it, buy it. And now you've got these people that have finally found relief or have come yeah. off other drugs. And now it's like, oh, and by the way, you don't get that anymore. Right. Um, I, I don't know. I think there's going to be a... a Huge Push. back a lot, yeah. Because I mean, the, the the industry is so big. I guess they have a job to do, but like this is crazy. We're trying to fix the plane while it's flying, right? We've already been in the air for a long time, and this last year really gave the industry momentum with COVID. I mean, it opened up this need for alternative medicine and different resources, and yeah, mm -hmm. it's seen a big impact. Impact. Um. Talk to me about your aquaponics. What, where, where are you at now? And what does this do for the industry? Yeah. And how so does this tie in? I just moved from Colorado to New Jersey in April. So I've been here for a few months now. I'm working with an aquaponics company called Shore Organics. And their vision is to grow uh, organic, certified, clean, green cannabis uh, that can then be used for various products. Um, we want to be totally off grid, so it'll all be solar. All of our rain, all of our water will be collected water, and just basically be totally off grid um, with a very minimal carbon footprint. And we grow um, aquaponically, so it's fish, um, a bunch of bio filters, and then the fish waste gets processed into a, a form that the plants can use, and then the plants use that for nutrients. And we have a closed loop system, so. Nothing in, nothing out, really, except for the fish food and the plants. So it's it's pretty cool, um, and it is a startup. So of course, startups always start up slow. Um, we're in the we're in the middle of a redesign it right now. Um, so we're not actually actively. We, well, we do have plants in the ground, but for the most part, they're not in the ground. They're in the water. Um, <laughs> we do we do have some plants growing right now, but really they're sort of. Um, we're, we're at the experimental phase because we're in the middle of a redesign, but it's very, very cool, very, very exciting. Um, we do have the organic certification, so we have to be, you know, we have to make sure that the design that we have will work for the, the nutrient needs for the plants and also the fish because it's a very fine line that we walk, you know, and we can't add any nutrients in because then it'll either kill the fish or throw the bacteria yeah. out of that. So everything that we do in the system is very slow. So when you're growing, let's say, hydroponically, you can add the nutrients and the plants respond very quickly to that. With this kind of system, we kind of have to stay two steps ahead of everything because mm -hmm. any changes that we need to make have to be done slowly and the response is going to be slow because, you know, you can't just dump something into the system because everything will crash. So it's um, it's, it's a very uh, a fun, interesting, um, exciting company to be working with and uh new jersey is not at all what i expected honestly it's <laughs> beautiful it is beautiful like okay I, yeah i live in central new jersey kind of where they showed that they, they made that one tv show um <laughs> but it is gorgeous they, there's lots of uh um nature areas preserves wildlife i've seen i saw a turtle crossing road the other day like it's amazing Ooh. Yeah, that's very different where I'm at. Ours are like antelope, deer. <laughs> no <Huh? turtles. laughs> I'm like Colorado. It's very different. Um, Stephanie just asked botanical approved. Uh, oh, botanical approval. 
I don't know what that's for. I wonder if she was talk, speaking to somebody else. Not something you were speaking about specifically. Um, maybe she was talking about having an organic certification. I'm not sure. Okay. Steph, if you want to clarify, or Stephanie, if you want to clarify, I'm not sure if you're speaking. I wanted to make sure your question got answered, so I figured I'd throw it up there really quick. Um, <laughs> so, future, where do you see things headed for yourself and, and oh, the man. industry? I, you know, I don't know. I Honestly, if I've learned anything about this industry, is that it keeps you on your toes, right? Everything is changing every day. There's something you <laughs> learn. There's something that's changed. Um, something that's you know, been passed or been, you know, like new rules come in. I mean, it just, it's crazy. I, um, that's my favorite part and the people, I'd say the people are actually my favorite. The number of, I mean, the bright, intelligent people that I, I meet the most innovative. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> and passion, really, the passion really, comes with the industry. I'm really hoping for more science. Um, the DEA, uh, recently said that they would start taking applications for other growers other than the University of Mississippi. However, they said that in 2016 as well, and they have 35 applications sitting on their desk um, mm -hmm. that they haven't even looked at as far as I'm aware. But, you know, with the my paper that's still in review, Daniela's got a paper because, we, you know, I gave her some DNA too. <laughs> I think yeah. that there is going to be, uh, they are going to have to address that shortly and make sure that um, for research purposes that there's a better variety of cannabis for any kind of research that goes on because we need to we need to be testing we need to do, be doing science on the same sort of stuff that you can go and buy at the store and right now that's not the case um, so so I hope that that will happen and I also hope that at some point um, it will be easier to get funding that universities will start let letting more research be done right now they can research hemp which is cool because it's cannabis and you know anything they find can in theory translate over to any kind of cannabis but there needs to be a, a there are a lot of questions um that need some scientific rigor and data to back up or figure out or whatever you know like we were talking about flushing before like we've got all kinds of questions that just are right now pro science but they could be answered um, through science and, and research. And validated. And, yeah, with yeah. credible yeah. sources, right? Not yeah. saying that the people that are doing them or that have the experience aren't right. It's that how do we bring that mainstream? And mm -hmm. Or, like you know, and, and where do these things come from? So, you know, people who, uh, you know, harvest in the dark or the curing process. Like, what is the science behind that? We, we've got all these people saying you have to do it and this is why. What what is it, you know, and, and like we've got to give some some data to put back into the all of all these, you know, different methods and procedures that people follow um, to give it some validity, you know. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, this, you know, the research side um, just keeps going and potentially ramps up more than we've had the ability to do up until you know, now. <laughs> well, we can't change what we don't know, right? Right. If we can't improve it if we don't don't understand it. So earlier you made a comment that's really stuck with me about your research of um, your, it, don't quote me, <laughs> because I'm probably <laughs> going to say this wrong, but you did research and one of the plants was more genetically related to a hemp strain than a cannabis strain. Um, where do you think that plays a role in the market? You know, when we talk about science and that education piece. So that actually was, so that's the paper that is being held up in review right now. Um, that is the, the cannabis from the University of Mississippi provided by the National Institute on Drug Abuse to marijuana studies. It's, it's the research oh. marijuana that if you're doing right research on marijuana, that's where you have to get your marijuana from you can't just go to the store and then do research there's a particular process that you have to follow when you're doing research on marijuana that's where you have to get your marijuana from i happened to get some uh not that they sent it to me because they never would send it if i asked for it to do genetic studies on it they would you know but we had a lab at my school uh at the chemist lab who was getting they were doing 
uh, extractions and tests on THC and CBD, and they had to get their marijuana from the University of Mississippi. I went up to the lab and I did my voodoo magic, got the DNA and walked out of the lab. You know, the, the professor obviously let me do it, but I didn't remove any. But I mean, so the thing is, the DEA is in charge of all of this research grade marijuana. So they are, it's very tightly regulated. It has to be in a locked metal box with a code in a freezer that has a lock on it that is tethered to the concrete floor and or wall. You have to account for all of the plant material. Everything has to be weighed, documented. You have to send in reports. They can come in and they can check on everything at any point in time when they want to. And so the stipulation was we can't remove any plant material from the lab, which I didn't do. I extracted the DNA in the lab and I just took the DNA and left. Well, that's very different, right? It's a very different, it's like taking a seed and saying you're buying flour. DNA mm -hmm. is not the same as the, like you said, the plant. And you can't, you can't smoke the DNA. Yeah. Right. So, um, so yeah, when I did the, and then, and then I had some cultivated hemp varieties. I had some feral hemp that had been collected, you know, out in Nebraska. I had some CBD stuff that was, I bought from my dispensary that was kind of more of a balanced or a low, like low THC, but still not a hemp, you know, it was like 2% THC. And then, you know, all the other kinds that you can buy at the, at any dispensary. Um, and we, we found that the, the stuff that the University of Mississippi is supplying for marijuana research is more closely related to hemp varieties than it is to anything that you would be able to get at a dispensary, which is disappointing, <laughs> to say the least. But it gives, you know, when Sue Sisley uh, came out with her whistleblowing that when she got her research material, it was moldy, it didn't smell like anything, it looked like oregano, like what's going on here? And they said, well, it's gone moldy on your shelf because we don't send out moldy material. And she's like, it's supposed to be 10%. It's testing at seven. What's going on here? So, you know, I was interested. Well, what, what is it? Where, what is going on? Where does it fall? Is it close to just, you know, stuff you get from the dispensary or, or is it something totally, it's something totally different. And it's really not even that really. It's so not that's a huge holdup in progress of research. Yeah. And any, and there aren't that many like marijuana studies of like people smoking or because in general, you know, for research, we don't want people smoking anything because smoking in general is not good for your lungs. So they kind of, you know, are, uh, they don't sort of support that kind of research, but there have been quite a few studies, um, nonetheless, that we're using that material for glaucoma, for example, like there are still people getting the government marijuana to treat their glaucoma, but if it, it's not even like the stuff at the dispensary, then of course it's not going to do the same. It's not the same, not right. The same. So people who are, who are saying, or any, any study that comes out and says, marijuana doesn't work for cancer. We did this study using research-grade marijuana and nothing happened. Well, no kidding. It's not. If we're not study. using research-grade marijuana to do the study, it makes it very difficult to prove the concept. Hmm. Yeah. And so really think about it. We've got people that are saying, well, I, I smoke marijuana every day and my cancer's gone. Um, and then you've got the scientists saying, no, we did a study and it didn't do that. It's like, well, you're using two different things. You're comparing apples and oranges. So, hey, let's do some of these studies again with, you know, actual medical grade um, marijuana that somebody would buy at a dispensary. And let's see if really, like, yeah, the difference. The yes. impacts and the difference, right? Yes. What is what is that high THC? Okay, so I have a question on, and this is more just opinion based, but you know, there's some controversy about the high THC and how some of the THC has almost become, you know, some of the flour is almost at thirty percent, thirty seven percent. It's almost a narcotic to some. What's your opinion on the recreational and the the ability to really play with the high THCs and the impact it has on the medical? Um, so this is a whole nother can of worms. So when I was doing my research, um, and I started looking at, you know, variation, um, you know, when I had like five blue dreams and they're genetically identical, I did look at the cannabinoid levels, uh, to see if there was a difference and there was, but I, when I was looking at the results from the, that study and I was looking at the packaging and the percent on the packaging, they were really, really, really different. And I was like, this is weird. Like, 
I have a test here that says this sample is 12% and yet the package says 28%. That's a really big difference. And I wanted to know what was going on. So I expanded that study and I went and bought a bunch of different stuff. And um, what I found in general is that whatever is printed on the label tested at about 30% less. Cool. Of THC. So when, and that's not 30% total, that's 30% of the number. So like if it says 28% on the label, the actual test that we did would be more like, you know, 12 or 19, but much, much slower, right? So, and that was true for um, every dispensary that I went to. I went to multiple different dispensaries. So it wasn't just one lab. You know, I went all over the state and presumably they were sending out to different, you know, they weren't only using the same lab. Um, and it wasn't like, so it wasn't one particular dispensary. So we can say that it's not one particular lab. They're all kind of, they're all, uh, way out of whack. So when, so this is something that people need to know is that when you buy something that says 30%, it's probably not. Well, and does some of that have to do with its shelf life? Like how long has the product been on the shelf? What happens when you get a fresh product compared to it wouldn't be that big of a difference. Okay. Uh, I did test two, like I had a sample that I split in half and I tested them 12 months apart and there was very, very little difference in the tea. Oh. There was a little bit of a difference, but it was very little. Um, so I, and if it's being stored correctly, it, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be that big of a THC difference. Um, what can make the difference is first of all, what did they send in for sampling? So did they, Take the very top flower. They're supposed to send, there's protocols and it's different in every state, but it's supposed to be, like the test is supposed to be a representative sample for that batch. So it should be kind of an average of everything. Um, and what I was sold, like, I don't know where that came from on the plant. It could have been the lower buds. It could have been, you know, like whatever. There's a lot of things that can, um, that could feed into this, you know, mm -hmm. things that I, that I was able to measure and see quite clearly. Um, but the consumer needs to know that because I bought my product as a consumer and was able to see that although it said 30% on the label, what I actually got was not 30%. So there's something amiss somewhere. Um, and it's becoming more, um, it's becoming more of an issue as other scientists are also in labs are starting to do more tests. It, uh, there's, you know, lab shopping where you go to the lab that gives you the best results. Um, and it's like this vicious cycle, though, because price points are set on THC. It's ridiculous, but that's how it is. So then, um, you know, labs are also, they have customers that come to them. And if they're doing tests and they test something at 12%, while lab B down the street is going to give you a result that says 25%. You're going to go back to that lab that says 25% because that's how you set your price point. So then labs, in order to stay in business, kind of have to come up and all be at the same level. So everybody's over, you know. So I don't know. This is another thing that needs to be sorted out in the industry. And there is no oversight for lab tests. So everybody sort of self-regulates you know, regulates and does internal audits. And everybody wants to do the right thing. But it's hard when that's how the market is kind of set. Um, well, and especially with this, what we've seen in the market, right? It's one thing if we knew price was going to be consistent, but it's not. And it's very, and when I say that from the farm to the production, right? As we developed and I mean, how much was isolate selling for at one time? Thousand, two thousand dollars compared to, you know. Yeah, see, and then it's the same thing with hemp. You know, like your CBD flower is going to sell at a price based on how much CBD is in it. So if you've got product that's only seven percent, you know, you're not going to make a lot of money from that. If you've got CBD that's at fifteen percent, they're twenty percent. Like you're going to get a lot more money for that. So it's a problem on both sides. You know, I think. Um, but we'll get there. That's a really good point. And then we'll get there. Uh, we just need mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, and put some science behind it and kind of, you know, iron out all the wrinkles because right now this is an issue. But again, this is a um, an, an education piece. So people need to know that although it says 30%, it might not be. And, and you know, there's all these 
media sensation arc, you know, like, you know, kids are dying because they're 30%. The, the potency has gone up, you know, ridiculous amounts over the last few years. Well, has it, or is it just the numbers that are kind of being inflated now? So we need to figure this out, right? That's really good. Yeah, really good point. And it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, well, I really appreciate your time. We're almost at an hour. I want to say thanks to everybody else that's that's joining us and let them know, let everybody know um, our, this will be shared on our YouTube channel. We'll record it, ed edit it, and republish it so it will be available to you. And then we just launched our new software, the hemphallway.com. Um, you can go on. This is where we're going to be able to log in, communicate with everybody, connect with members. Uh, there's a map. You can post different uh, events, attend different events, and so forth. So I'd love to have you guys join. And then remind you that tomorrow at two o'clock with Billy Styles, we have a Q and A series. You can find that on our website um, under our education series or on our LinkedIn. Um, and then our two interviews, Joe Hickey and then Cody on Friday. So really excited. But Anna, how can we or um, others in the industry dive in and really support what you're doing? And then how do people get in touch with you if they want to connect? So I'm pretty easy to find. Um, I have a pretty big social media presence. Um, I have, you know, Facebook where you can message me. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on ResearchGate. Um, I do have a website, which is probably, I mean, it, it'll send you to my research, my podcast, webcasts. Um, and also, you know, you can click any of the little icons and, and email me, whatever. So that's uh, com. So also very easy to find. Um, and then I am up on the board for the Agricultural Genomics Foundation, which is a science-based uh, nonprofit organization set up by Daniela Vergara. Um, and uh, any she, they take donations um, that will go to 100% to, to cannabis science research. So if anybody really wants to uh, see that train keep going. Um, yeah, donations through um, Agricultural Genomics Foundation. And that's also on my website. If you click it, it'll take you to their website and all that. Awesome. Um, yeah. And I have people that send me questions all the time. So don't feel like you can't reach out if you've got a question and I can help. I'm happy to. So awesome. 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 Well, I would love to continue this conversation. Obviously, the most of our work that we talk about at the Global Hemp Association is around the industrial manufacturing. But did that with the intent of putting a voice there and realizing that it's really all one plant and encompassing and it touches just all of these different sectors and different pieces and verticals. So however we can support you and continue to collaborate and bring the right education, I think that's key also is really focusing on you know the right type of content. And so I'm really excited to have you and your team join us. I'd love to welcome you back and talk about other subjects. Delta 8 is always a topic I want to talk about because it's, it's like poking this bear. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a it's a touchy subject within the industry, and it's one that you know the consumers are just it's hemp, right? That's what it says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm actually going to a conference in Florida. I don't know next week, maybe I think. Um, and I'm on a panel of it's called the Delta Eight Showdown panel of people, scientists, and whatnot. Four of us are for it and four of us are against it and i was like awesome. do, I, do i need to bring a pistol is this going to be at high noon like people get very passionate about delta eight and you know well, is it strongly for it or pretty strongly against it so yeah i'm not sharing an opinion one way or the other <laughs> i have an opinion but is this a means to save a business or recoup costs that were lost while we tried to build, or some of these people tried to build a CBD business or a extraction company, and now found this way to uh, sell product at a, uh, to sell, because now it's moving, I mean, Delta 8 is moving on the shelves, right? To sell product, and like you said, do I ethically go to a lab that uh, gives me the correct value of, or correct percent, or do I go to the one that's making me more money? And I feel like this is like that revolving door of I, you that know, fine I, line in both the legal side and the ethical side of products. Um, I think it's great that, you know, all the CBD that's been sitting around, unable to move, um, you know, we have to do some, you know, like these poor people, this is their livelihood, this is their mm -hmm. business, you know, like 
great. However, creating Delta-8 from CBD isolate um, is not regulated. That's like one of the things that I really struggle with. Um, it's also THC, um, you know, and then there's the, the, the analog act that comes into the, the uh, I, um, yeah, I don't think it's going to fly for very long. And people who are putting all their eggs in that basket might want to look to do something else because I don't think it's going to fly for much longer. Well, especially if CBD, you know, and now that you say this, I wonder if this, you know, we poke the bear with the Delta-8. You no, know, do you suppose that classes no. CBD as a drug, you know, in the drug category, you know, doesn't come from what we're capable of doing with it in the lab? You know, so now it really does. It pushes it right back to this drug. Well, once you pull it out of the plant, that's the FDA that mm -hmm. regulates that now. So you've got this FDA regulated substance that you're turning into Delta 8, which is DEA regulated. Like, I don't think that's a very good idea. Like, <laughs> yes, it is a hemp extract, but it's outside of the plant and it has a lot of CBD in it. That is a drug. Her well, it's like, like grapes, FDA, right? Uh, so I, I've taken this back to grapes, just like you did in the beginning, right? Is grapes are regulated different than wine. Not until we make that transaction, is it regulated differently? And I would imagine Delta is the same <laughs> or yeah. along those same lines. You, 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 when you take it out of the plant, it is no longer hemp. Right. It's, it's a product of hemp, but it's, it's not in the plant as the law states. It's out of the plant. And now it's a drug. According to the FDA, they've put their foot down. So, yeah, I don't, I mean, I am worried for everybody who's, you know, has a CBD business or whatever, but, and, and myself included, you know, Shore Organics wants to work towards, you know, medicine, uh, CBD, you know, production. Well, I think it's reality. It's right. Here's a resource. We know that it's coming. How do we transition and pivot to continue to be successful, right? And to meet the consumer's needs under all of the different regulations and the safety. I mean, really, it's what makes us a sustainable long-term business is falling within those those guidelines. Yeah, and being smart. You know, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I I get that people want D eight to be legal, but. You know, I don't know how long it, this is going to go on for because there's some scary products out there, honestly. Like, you know. Um, well, and and some of them taste as synthetic as they get. I mean, yeah. they just, if you, anyway. Okay, well, thank you for touching the bear. <laughs> I didn't want to talk too much about Delta 8. It's a conversation that comes up all the time. And I'm actually going to bring Greg Gerdman on here um, in the next day or a few days, next few weeks. And we're going to talk, dive into the Delta 8 discussion as well. Um, but long story short, thank you so much for joining me today. I would love to continue to connect. Are you going to be at the uh, Southeast or the Southern Hemp Expo or the Missouri? One, the one uh, in Florida. I'll be there, yeah. No, this one is North Carolina. There's one in North Carolina and Missouri. No, neither nope. of those. No, I have uh, in Orlando next week at the Southeast CBD Expo, I think. And oh, they also have Delta 8 Conference at, under the same roof. Um, and then in September, I think I'll be in Boston for the uh, International Cannabinoid Derived Pharmaceutical Conference, talking about, you know, whole plant, which in pharmaceuticals isn't really a thing. A thing. Um, but they're very interested in whole plant medicine, so I'm going to go talk to them about the plant instead of the pharmaceutical. Um, I love it. And then some hemp conference in Texas towards, I think it's November. Okay. Yeah, so I'm well, around. If we run into each other or for the same event, I'd love to see you. I'd love to connect. I'm Give not hard to find. So. <laughs> <laughs> Your pink hair and my height. I'm 6'2", so everybody's like, oh, I see her. I can see her over oh, the yes. shelf. <laughs> yeah, you can be able to see in the crowd and see my hair very easily. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you very, very much, Anna. I appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you, everybody else, for listening. Don't forget to share, like, comment, join in on our conversations. Click that little reminder button on your LinkedIn and YouTube channel so that you're reminded of our upcoming events. Other than that, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Anna. See yep. you later.